Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Rasar M. Hotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Nia, Thursday, September the 21st, 2023. And we are going to have a discussion on the etymology of the name Desharet in the ancient Egyptian language. And so, you know, I'm the king of controversy. And so I can't wait to share with y'all to get the waters stirred. So all that and more when we return in just a moment. Just get this off for a second. And try to get some light on me. I hope each and every one of y'all are doing well out there in YouTube and Facebook and X land, formerly known as Twitter. And uh, yeah, we're going to get it in today. And so um, I'm going to say that hopefully if we have some time because I got to be somewhere at six. Uh, there's actually two parts to this discussion today. So I'm going to deal with Desharet and then I'm going to deal with Zimatawi in the next video. But it's going to be immediately after this video. So, you know, if you're still rocking with me by the end of this, uh, in the description, there is uh, the link is going to say for part two. And when, you know, we end this show, uh, part two is going to start on the same channel. But to get to the link directly, you got to get to uh, that link. So I'm going to put it in the chat right now. For those of you on Facebook and YouTube, and I'm on YouTube, I'm going to pin the link to the top. And I'm going to do that right now. So the link to the next show after this one is I just posted it, and it should also be pinned to the very top of the page. So without further ado, oh, let me give a few shout outs. Peace and blessings to everyone who is, uh, of course, joining us live. And then, of course, those of you who will be joining the archive. So uh, peace and blessings to learn together with Obam, who is in the building. Sister Tamika is always in the building. And thank you for your continued support. And Omari Lyles is in the building all the way from Long Beach, California. Shout out to the West Coast in this building. And Stephen McKenzie is in the place. And Dasha Rob is in the place. And he says, so the session meta nature is really not translated correctly to you, huh? Um, it's... A lot of work has been done on the session meta nature, but key and core concepts, some are either wrong or could be explained better. And so that's what, you know, African scholars continue to, to refine these definitions that you find in the dictionaries and the like. 
And, you know, this was something that was started even, you know, back in the day for us with Dr. Riketi Ahmed, who would always stress us that we need to start over on the meta All right. And he says, it's like in dictionary, some etymologies are not accurate. That's why revision exists in the publication and editing industry. Exactly. So peace to, uh, and please forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but Kemo Ben Yisrael is in the building. Thank you for joining. Uh, che is in the building and Octo Thorpe is in the building. Thank each and every one of you for uh, joining the conversation uh, for us today. So, oh, and also Zane Montego is in the building. Thank you um, for joining the conversation as well. So again, we're on three platforms today on YouTube, on Facebook, as well as on X, right? And so, let me just close a few windows uh, here and so I can make sure I can free up some memory. And so, so as many of you know, I have released a new text by the name of Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, Towards a, excuse me, an etymology of the place named Kemet. And this is my commercial for it. Yeah, yeah. Tokyo on a dose at. What's up? Feeling like I dropped the drop on part uno. Yeah. Came to kick the door where the game man drew up. Oh, yeah. Pin game low. That's why they give me kudos. Uh -huh. Spied by the three O. Oh. Five nine five check it for oh, Pan flag. Hit the turn price line to a baseline. Got a sound like I just hit the eight five. Oh, I'm so ready. My enemies necessary. We gon' be legendary. Hold up. Mm. About to grow the payrolls. If you see the vision and you're with it, you should say so. Cause we about building, elevating the millions. Already. And so, you know, part of this discussion today is in this text, and I intend to do a full article, uh, a journal article on the word desharet. So the, the reason why we have this discussion on the, the word desharet is because the word kemet is always contrasted or often contrasted with the word desher, desharet. And so Egyptologists interpret this as the black in terms of Kemet and red in terms of Desharet lands. And so, but what, you know, uh, many people fail to realize is that the ancient Egyptians would had many homonyms and homographs in the language. And so while there are terms that look like these terms. Um, the, the words that were used to define these places may not be the terms, the color terms that the Egyptologists have assumed uh, since the beginning. And so, you know, this is what the book addresses. And so we'll, you know, I guess we won't technically leave Kemet uh, alone, but uh, for for this conversation, the focus isn't going to be on the word Kemet, but on the word Desharet. So what I'm going to do is share my screen like so. I'm gonna do the entire screen. I don't have any audio. So we're going to do the full screen because, you know, I like I want to make sure each and every one of you get the assignment. And so we are going to start from the beginning. All right. So I will wait a second and make sure I guess I could be learning. Uh, 
Here we go. All right. So, all right. So we're ready. So uh, the etymology of Desheret, not the red man. That's not all the way right, but it's essentially right. And, and you will we'll see why so in a second. So just want to first and foremost, thank each and every one of you who have joined the Patreon. Um, it is your support that allows for me to take some time off and put these presentations together. And of course, you get exclusive access to some of the early lectures and um, the, you know, clips of the upcoming film um, and, and notes in, in the progress for when that is happening. So if you have not joined the Patreon, please consider joining the Patreon today. That is patreon.com forward slash sarmhotep. And you can visit me on my website at sarmhotep.com. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is my latest text, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, for which a lot of this conversation is drawn from. So make sure that you get your copy today. You can get it at my website or you can get it at Amazon. Um, so I look forward to your feedback. And, you know, I think everyone who has pre-ordered should have gotten their books by now. And and so I'm just going to wait probably about two weeks to give you all a chance to at least go through the uh, the preface and the introduction. And I'm going to do an open open forum Q&A for that uh, for those for those two chapters. And, you know, we'll go uh, through the subsequent chapters, you know, at, at a later time. Right. So, of course, this is the Qicom initiative. Uh, which we, we'll, you know, we've discussed in a previous video, but we won't discuss here. But it is the underlying philosophy, paradigm, and praxis that is the result of this research on the word Kemet itself. So we'll talk about that at a later time. And so what we are going to do is focus on this. So as I mentioned earlier, when they define the word desharet. They define it as the red land. And you can see from, and this is a photo of the deserts on, you know, the outskirts of Egypt, but Egypt itself is mainly desert itself. So, you know, this poses a problem when you're talking about, you know, uh, Desharet as a place, um, that doesn't include Egypt. So, you know, how do you define uh, the red lands when the vast majority of your country is in fact the red lands, right? Um, and so you can see that there is some, there is some, you know, closeness in terms of color when you look at the sand um, that, you know, may warrant the labeling of, well, this is the red lamp. But as I argue, this is not quite, this is not quite accurate. There may have been some play on words at, at times, but when the Egyptians thought of the desert, they thought they had something else in mind. There's a there's a more unique characteristic that stands out besides the color of the actual sand, right? And so, again, as I, I've stated, the, you know, most of Egypt itself is desert, you know, that includes the territories. So when we're talking about Desharet, you know, it can't be like another political territory and then Kemet just be, you know, what's on the borders on, on, on here. So like something else has to give. But even when you look at the actual sand, everywhere you go, the sand is not red, right? And this was noted by a number of uh, Egyptologists and scholars, you know, before me, right? So even in this text, it's uh, originally written in French. Um, and so it is uh, a translated into English, uh, read and visual nuances um, by Gustave Lefebvre. I don't know how you pronounce the name. 
Lefebvre. Uh, I don't know how you say the V and the V at the same time. Ver, or the ver, rue. You know, almost kind of like when you say the Louvre. It's kind of like Le Fouvre. I don't know. I'm messing it all up. So, but it's in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, 1949. And on page 72, this is the uh, the relevant section in French for those of you who can read it. But I have translated it into English. And here is my rough translation. So he says, However, it is hard to believe that the desert appeared exclusively red to the Egyptians. In fact, on a wooden stele in the Cairo Museum coming from the Theban necropolis, the gabel or the mountain, or jebel, some pronounce it, is painted in yellow striped and spotted with red. We would say that it is tawny. Desher is still the color of the barley used to prepare beer, Desher, and which we would rather consider blonde. So what, what this entails, and in our last video, I mentioned that for, for linguists, when we're looking at color terms in various different languages, we try to avoid uh, associating colors in other languages in the same way that we do in English, if we're English speakers. Because in, in other languages, they may have more terms for color or less terms for color, for which if there are less terms for color, the, the words themselves will be associated with a range of colors. So it is my argument here that when we're talking about desher, because desher can also mean blood, like it, it can it can refer to a deep red and brownish red all the way to a pale color, yellow and even white to an extent. As we can see here, he's referencing the color blonde, right? So what that particular color range would include Desher. And that's why, you know, uh, we can see here that this is a lot paler and lighter, almost yellowish brown in comparison to this, which is, you know, a, a bit redder in color, but it's all the same landscape, you know, that surrounds Egypt itself, right? So, and of course, this is in contrast with the, you know, the wet soil and it would have to be the, the you know, the, the black wet soil versus so you can see here that the ground really is more of a whitish grayish color. And it's only when the ground is wet that it becomes um, dark in terms of its color. Right. So this is along the now here. So, you know, so this, of course, vastly contrasts with this, you know, and you can still see plant life on non-black soil, as you can see uh, on the shrubs here. So, you know, again, these, these are ideal representations and it doesn't apply to every, you know, stretch of land. So just as a reminder of how I've defined Kemet, uh, and, and I have to address this because for some reason there are people who think that I, in fact, changed my, or I came to this conclusion that Kemet, uh, you know, doesn't mean black, but uh, refers to like farmland, wetland and the like based upon Jean-Claude and Bowley. And that is farthest from the truth. And so for those who have my text, The Bacala of North America, it was published in 2009, I think maybe the beginning or going into spring of 2009, where I argue that, you know, Kim uh, means farm there. And but there was still some trying to hold on to blackness there in that text. And later on in the year, this is when I made this comment. So for those who don't know, my birth name 
is Harold Johnson. So, you know, my Facebook page, this is the post. And anybody who is Facebook friends with me can just go on my page and search this and it will pop up and it shows up exactly how it is here. And I state on November 23rd, 2009, that on the further linguistic investigation, I have come to the conclusion that the word Kemet means farm or garden, which can also be rendered country. My final decision is based on the fact that the earliest form of the word has a determinative for irrigated land. So in essence, when you are saying a Kemite, you are saying a farmer. Kemet has nothing to do with black skin. So this was in 2009. This is 14 years ago. And this is significant because Jean-Claude Mboli's text doesn't come out until 2010, at the end of 2010. Right. And, and sometimes you'll see uh, folks uh, cite Mboli as 2011 because it was at the end of 2010, but really kind of was out there, like I think January of 2011, right? So it, it's impossible for me to have come to this conclusion based on Mboli, right? And so, you know, uh, so for, for those who are just joining the, this debate and conversation, I have been arguing this for 14 years now, going on 15 in terms of this point. And that's just the published material. So it's really kind of uh, 2008 since um, the Bacala, you know, it was published in 2009, but it was written, you know, earlier, of course, right? So that being said, you know, this is from um, a previous discussion and uh, where I go through the details and the proofs that, you know, these, other two languages, Sumerian and Shiluba, have a number of cognates for the term Kemet, and I've defined Kemet roughly as a pasturage with an abundance of grass and water. And uh, a cognate can be found in Sumerian as Kiduru, meaning damp ground, irrigable, irrigable land, and in Shiluba, Chiankanda, piece of land, field, part of the land being plowed in the day. In other words, farmland, right? And so, and in the text, the uh, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, I make the argument that the etymology of the word Kemet uh, comes from the word, you know, Kem meaning complete and full, and that it has an earlier form meaning to rise and verb form, to rise and to fill. And, you know, its nominal form is Kim complete. And then, you know, we have the place name Kemet, a.k.a. the riparian land, right? And so, you know, a riparian land is a land in which a river runs through it and it, and it floods all along the banks, right? And where a lot of, um, where people, you know, grow food and they it allows for pasturages for uh, animals and the like, right? So this is, you know, riparian land is an all-encompassing term. And so, you know, you'll see me define it, you know, as riparian land, but also as a pasturage with an abundance of grass and water, as well as wetlands, irrigable land, arable land, all of those are within the same semantic range, right? And so here are the most dominant forms of the word Kemet. There's a few other renditions, which we've talked about before, but I want to stress in the classifiers of these forms, each and every one of them, which you see on the right-hand side, have to deal with irrigated land. These are all different uh, determinatives or classifiers for irrigated land, and that plays a big uh, difference that makes a big difference when it comes to the overall interpretation, right? And so here are, you know, the main Egyptian colors. We have the word desher on the on the left, and we have Ertiu blue, and Kenyut, or Kenyut, or Kenywu, um, or we could say Quini. Uh, for yellow, and then we have hajj, meaning white, 
and you know wereg wereg meaning to grow green and then wereg green and then we have the word kim meaning black and so notice the the classifiers and the determinatives at the each so they uh for for red sometimes you'll see it with the flamingo because the flamingo is kind of pinkish white and and uh, but other times you'll see this little circle here which is like a granule and it is used for words for color or texture and so these are one of the color determinatives and um, and then in these other forms, you'll have more ideographic determinatives that, you know, better articulate the, the concepts. So when you think about white, you know, of course, you think about white light. And then, of course, when you're talking about greens, you, you can think of plants. But even the word for green itself has the color determinative. And then we have Kim Black with the falling hair determinative, right? And, and so you can see that the vast majority of these have the, uh, the, the pellet color symbol as its graphing. So um, as I've stated before, the true meaning of Kemet is, you know, in the cognate, sometimes you'll see it as a word for village or country. Um, and then, you know, more properly, a new pasturage with an abundance of grass and water. And the difference between a kemet and a desheret is what I argue is that a kemet is a type of land that has grass, water, um, vegetation, edible food, is a good place to settle and raise animals and crops. Um, but a desheret is the exact opposite. It has no plants, no water, um, no life whatsoever, right? So uh, let's. So here is the word uh, desher again in uh, the ancient Egyptian language. And so, as we saw before, here we have this word uh, desher meaning red. And it uses this flamingo uh, kind of in two ways because the, the flamingo itself, its consonants is the D -sh R sequence. And so it can stand alone as an ideogram in this sense, um, but you can see the glyph spells it out right here in these monoliterals right here. And, um, and so it can stand for the flamingo itself or to represent the consonants for the color red. So I hope that makes sense. And then you have this same consonant sequence in the word desheret, meaning a desert, but that also that same root is for desheret, meaning flame. So, you know, the same issues that you have with the word kemet, there are a number of words, there are a number of desher words in the Egyptian language that are uh, homographs, right? Because they didn't write out their vowels. And when they come to define this term, they never eliminate all the other possibilities. Because again, the people who were compiling these dictionaries they weren't linguists per se. They were, at least they weren't historical comparative linguists um, to be able to use that tool to get to the bottom and the roots of these words. They were philologists, right? So, you know, the comparison with the Greek and, and the Coptic, you know, started a process of the decipherment and, you know, they were able to distinguish what words were what after examining a number of, you know, multilingual you know, inscriptions and texts that were found at different periods of time. And so this is how they were able to understand the language, you know, uh, to a particular degree. But, you know, only more recently, comparatively in history, where they're now starting to get to try to get to the etymological roots 
of of words and things to better understand the language and so this is why we have to revisit all of these terms to to make sure that we understand them correctly because unfortunately we can't go speak to an ancient egyptian and they just tell us what the words means and how they're pronounced right so um We'll, we'll be taking some conversation from this text here. This is by an Egyptologist by the name of Alessandra Nibi. And, you know, she started a journal titled uh, Discussions in Egyptology. And so there's uh, a, a book, some geographical notes on ancient Egypt, a selection of published papers between 1975 and 1997. Uh, written by Alessandra Nibby. And she, there's an article in the, it's probably the second to the last chapter, uh, titled Some Notes on the Two Lands. And she, she makes this observation here that I want to repeat. She says, in Egyptology or Egyptology adopted many errors in accepting the translations of the early great scholars without discussion. We must now urgently think more objectively and dispassionately, you know, because people be in their feelings about uh, terms in ancient Egypt, about Tamehu and Tashtamau um, and the two lands. Because remember, the, the subject of this is the two lands. So she's trying to uh, define Tamehu and Tashimahu in terms of the icons and the emblems associated with it. So when you have an opportunity to read that, you can read it for yourself in the two lands. We must consider how we can define a foreigner or an enemy in ancient Egypt. And in the next paragraph, she talks about how uh, we need to be able to define an Egyptian as well. Now, I, I bring up this to, to show that, as I stated earlier, you know, the the early Egyptologists were not linguists. So they put forth hypotheses that Egyptology as a discipline just accepted without any kind of verification or discussion whatsoever. And this is something that I've mentioned, of course, over and over again with the word Kemet. And she has noted this and another and, and a series of other scholars have noted this as well. Like when you when you try to do your literature review and you try to find an article or a text, you know, that goes through the systematic process of proving that this means this and this refers to this. It doesn't exist because, you know, somebody may in in another article in passing say, well, I believe that this means this. And then people just took it and ran with it because of the prestige of the scholar without any kind of verification process whatsoever. And so I wanted to put this, you know, out there to show that this is this has already been noted as late as 1997. Right. And and with Alessandra Nibby, you got to you got to comb through her stuff with a, uh, a fine tooth comb because, you know, of course, she's a European. So she comes at this very Eurocentric and any type of thing kind of associated with Africans. She tries to make it Mediterranean and Middle Eastern. And so you, you just got to, you know, it's a hit or miss with her. So you just got to do your due diligence and, and be skilled and knowledgeable to be able to know, you know, when she has something and when she doesn't. Right. But so now let's get on this this concept of the red land. So she and I'm going to be citing many different scholars. So I just want to start off with her. So in her text, the two lands, the black and the red, excuse me, in her chapter, her article uh, in this text, some geographical notes on ancient Egypt, she states the following. I also emphasize that there are occasions in the text where Kemet is referred to as a hostile place, and it may even be found listed in the execration text of the Old Kingdom. In that paper, no particular city was identified for this term, though we hope to do so this time. Furthermore, as Professor Kelly Simpson rightly emphasized in that discussion, any consideration of Kemet must be related to its frequent association with Desheret. 
if we are ever to arrive at a satisfactory conclusion. I then pointed out that the soils of the delta are not all black. There are areas of red soil in several places in the delta and in lower Egypt. The most strikingly red soil of all is in the Heliopolis area. It is in fact a red clay, and as such, the geologists say it is an old formation and not a relatively new deposit. So a few notes here. So first thing, when she talks about Kemet, she doesn't believe per se that the word Kemet refers to the entire like length of the Nile. She argues that it means a city, like a black city, and, and that is due to the newt symbol that we saw earlier. And just to help y'all, so this symbol here. So because of this symbol and it's associated normally with a, a, a village or a quote unquote city, she believes that when you speak of Kemet, that you're only talking about one city in one place. And she argues in this text that it is Memphis or Menefer, the, the real name, you know, of, oh, I'm too far back. All right. And so, so just note that. And then, so for now, so for Desharet, she argues that Desharet is Heliopolis. And we'll get into that in a moment. But she noted, because she, she went there several times and she would travel all throughout the Delta and notice that when you go to the Delta, there's actually red land in the Delta. So if, if, the, if the red land was exclusive to you know, the outskirts or the desert itself, it, it would not be all accurate, could not describe all of Egypt because you had this area here where the 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 soils, the red clay soils, the, the land is red, um, a deep red in more so in Heliopolis and then the surrounding areas is red itself. So we'll discuss and we can see this is her map on the that she she provided on um in her text so right here i don't know if you can see this you probably can't but it, it says kemet and then it says memphis right and then she argues that the desheret is really this area here in 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 the the delta area and and that both of them both kemet and desheret is in the delta and that when you're talking about the two lands you're talking about two different sides of the Nile River. So you're talking about the red land on the on the eastern side and then the black land on the western side. So this is her argument. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just letting you know what her argument is, right? So she created this map to to facilitate the discussion and and so even to this date it is, you know, uh, you have Gebel El Ahmar and Amar is Arabic for red, right? So this is this area here. So let me let me continue reading here. So she says, taken literally, it means that Heliopolis was never a part of the black land or the black city, but a red land, possibly the red land, Desheret. The text implies that the red land is a northern area and also that it extended towards the east. Although more often written, with the hill country determinative. Desharet is sometimes written with the town determinative. We must therefore accept that a red city existed along the red hill country in the vicinity of the eastern border of the Delta, probably with some influence upon its surrounding territory. So again, we'll go to the next page where you can see it a bit better. And so where I have this yellow arrow is where she makes the argument that Desheret, the red city, you know, in terms referring to Heliopolis, the, the city of the sun, right? And that that the, the Desheret in terms of the land is all this area here. So this is all quote unquote lower Egypt, right? And so when, and so according to her, basically, when you're really talking about Kim and she kind of contradicts herself later on because when, when she says the when you're talking about the state of Egypt, really you're kind of when you're talking about the two lands, you're talking about again the eastern side of the Nile 
and the western side of the Nile, but all referring to Lower Egypt. So anything, excuse me, yeah. So anything past the Delta is not the 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 quote unquote the two lands, right? And so uh, this 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 has to be investigated more and 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 looked at more carefully. But anyway, so uh, so I'm gonna read from the right. So she says a text from Dendera speaks of a goddess, probably Hathor, as the lady of the red land in Heliopolis, right? So which is Un, right? The, the city of Un or On in the Bible. Right. So when it's when the Bible mentions the city of On, it's Heliopolis. Right. So it's talking about, you know, uh, you know, the lady of heaven. So the, the lady Nevet, and then Desher, you know, of Un. And another inscription on a fragment of a stele in the Louvre dating to Ramesses II speaks of Harakte, the great god, and of Hathor, lady of Desheret, lady of the sky over the two lands. So you see the same thing over here, uh, lady of the sky, oh, this, this is Hathor, um, lady of the sky, and then Desheret, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, lady, you know, of the desert. So let me read this correctly. This is Hathor, Nebet, lady of the Desher, and then Nebet, um, Pet, Lady of the Sky, right? And then, um, and then over the two lands. So the two lands you can see is these two glyphs here. So this implies that Desheret is one of the two lands. Moreover, it reminds us of the Greco-Roman reference to the city of Heliopolis as Pet Net Kemet, with the town determinative, the sky of the black city. Reference. So remember that when she thinks of Kemet, she thinks of a city. So she's a, she's putting forth the hypothesis that it is Memphis. So reference to the inhabitants of the red city, Remetu Desheret, is also found in the in the text. The discussion by Henrik Brooks or Brooks of the red land is among the first we have and is still valid. He rightly concluded from the textual references that that the red land was the hilly area extended eastwards of the delta though i would not agree with him and with h gothier and many scholars today that this area extended as far as the sinai or the red sea or much further north than Beldes, which is right here um, these deserts are not red in the same way right because remember there's different different shades of red and yellow and, and pale white when you are off white, as we would say. Um, so again, this is a more close up picture of where she is arguing the red land is. So when, so let's assume for the simple, for the sake of argument that she is correct. This would imply that the, that the so-called red land and the, uh, the black land Kemet are the exact same territory. And so we got to remember that the Delta matter of fact got a, a lot of the flood plain too so they got the quote-unquote black silt and because it was of a lower uh, elevation this is why they had to build so many mounds so that their houses would not get flooded so this this area in the delta was actually known as the mounds place it was it was documented and i documented in the text because of all the mounds that were there, but that was there so they can grow food and build their houses on top of it because of the floodplain. So all of this would technically, by the, if, if we define Kemet as the black land, this would all be the black land here, and then this would be Desheret. So I'm putting forth these hypotheses to just let you know the extent of the conversation when it regards this. And I wanted to kind of make a quick note here so where it says a Heliopolis was pet net Kemet, um, which they define as the sky or she defines as the sky of the black city. I prefer to, to say um, that it is, it should be defined as uh, uh, basically kind of heaven on earth, right? So, you know, the heaven of Kemet. And we see a similar kind of concept in South Africa 
And I've taken this from the, the text, African Ethnonyms and Toponyms by UNESCO. And so in, in uh, this one chapter here, we're talking about, um, dang, I forgot what language this was. Was it Shona? It wasn't Shona. It was, um, oh, I forgot which language uh, that they were speaking about. I could pull it up and, and get it. Um, so um, I guess it's Swazi. So it says, Ezuwini is the place name of one of the most beautiful valleys of Swaziland. It is also the scene of the great epic and historical drama in the formation of the Swazi nation. Ezuwini literally means the heavenly place. A number of large and small rivers run through this valley, which stretches from the foothills of Imbabani eastwards to Mazini and curves southwards through the Malkern's farming estates to Luyingo, sometimes called the Imbabani Manzini Corridor, the Elzuini Valley is destined to become the heart of a future urban complex with cultural institutions, entertainment facilities, and royal residencies. Anyway, and so you know the word Zulu means heaven or the sky. So that Elzu in the um, Zuwini is Elzuini. Um, that's that's what it means in terms of, of heavenly and knee meaning place. So. Um, so that's how I kind of view it. And the reason why it's considered a heavenly place is because of the presence of the small rivers running through it. And when you read my, my uh, last chapter, the Appendix E on uh, Kemet and the Garden of Eden, I wish I, um, I had this text, but I wish I would have remembered this citation. I would have added this to that chapter but we talk about you know the the garden of eden and why it was considered a garden of eden a garden of paradise and so that was their way of saying the same thing as as Uini, you know the heavenly place it was a paradise place because of the presence of water is flooding and the abundance of grass and fruit and food and things of that nature so you can see this common toponymic uh, reference. And so I just wanted to, to bring that up as a kind of a side note. So let's get back. So now continuing with uh, Dr. Nibby, these deserts are not red in the same way as Heliopolis of the Red Mountains are red. Bruch was very perceptive, nevertheless, in associating Desheret with the red color of the ground. Furthermore, he rightly emphasized that the red land was a northern area to which the texts sometimes refer as the eastern extension of Memphis or the eastern Memphis. In fact, it goes so far as to say that the red land cannot be separated from the Memphite known, right? And so she she adds this uh, commentary. I just, instead of typing it, because I wanted to keep the, the, the text there, the hieroglyphic text. So in this study of the throne in ancient Egypt, Klaus Kuhlmann quotes a text from Abydos, which says, I have given to you the double throne of your father, Osiris, his heritage consisting of the whole land. I agreed in the light of justice to let you inherit the black land or Kemet, black city, as she determines it, and the red land as deputy for Harakta. So she makes her comment and says, it is clear in this text that the whole land consists here of the black city in the red land, namely the, the two lands, sometimes written with the two tongues of land, Idibri, otherwise with the two flat silt signs. So for her, you know, she's making the argument that the two lands itself is not upper and lower Egypt, but it is the both Kemet and Desheret, which really refers to Memphis and uh, Heliopolis, respectively. And, you know, I do not agree with this argument, but I'm putting it out there just to, you know, because it's just part of the literature review. And but it, it is worth considering in terms of her her larger arguments. And of course, we don't have time to go through all of that today. So. We move on to Dr. Gaber Takax, or Gabor Takax. And in his Etymological Dictionary of Egyptian, Volume 1, A Phonological Introduction, he puts forth the following commentary. And of course, we won't go through each of these. 
Um, but, you know, he equates the word Desher to in red, and then he gives Desheret, the desert meaning red land. Um, he says, identified by Schneider with Semitic for the word Sahar. So when you when you say desert or the Sahara, like when you say Sahara desert, they mean the same thing. So, but you so what he's arguing is that the word desher comes to mean is 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 found in the uh, Semitic languages as Sahara, right? And so, because it's kind of hard to read here, so I typed it out for you. The area, so he says in Syriac, is Sahar, blush, you know, like to blush red, and then aromatic, um, Sahar, to be white red and yellowish, and Sahara, meaning desert in the Sahara Desert, right? And so, uh, and so he proposes these other forms in Central Chadic. So remember that he's a big Afroasiaticist. And so, uh, and so you find these forms that I have highlighted in red, Dazu, Suz, Dizu, Dizu, Duzu, Dizu, Jews, Ziz, Ziz, all meaning red. But he rightfully asks the question, but how to explain the final Egyptian R? So, um, you know, in, unless he is able to show a, a series of sound meaning correspondences with these consonants in sequence where we can see where the R is dropped in central Chadic, um, then, you know, these, in my opinion, these words are not even related to uh, the term. And so <clears throat> the forms that you, I'm sorry, let me get a little closer. The forms that you find in the Semitic languages is clear that these are borrowings into Semitic from Egyptian. And I'll prove why, because you can't break this down any further in Semitic. And we'll get into that. And so, for example, like in Arabic, the word for red is Ahmad, Hemer. In Moroccan Arabic, in Maltese, Amar. Like this is their word for red. In Berber, Azugweg, Azgweg, Zegwag. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. But all this is red. So this, these aren't inherited. The, the Seher is not inherited um from their so-called uh afro-asiatic right is is a very limited distribution and we will see later on in our conversation exactly why these are borrowed because the word for red in egyptian comes from a a mono a, a consonant vowel monosyllabic root which doesn't exist in semitic and this is why the comparative work is important so uh, when i went to the Tower of Babel database, you know, it has Semitic here in Arabic, Sahara, meaning desert, right? So I assume if they, and, and this is, notice that in, well, I guess this is, yeah, so this is the same one. So um, I, I apologize. I said this was Aramaic, but this is uh, Arabic right here. So Syriac um, and then Arabic. And so uh, here to be white, red, yellowish, and Sahara with the T um, that became a glottal stop. So this is how we know that this was borrowed from Egyptian, right? And so we have this word here for desert, and then Western Chadic, Bogum, Shr, and then um, Asur, meaning sand. And so a little bit of background here. So you see this dotted H in the center here of this word Sahara, where you get the word Sahara from. When, when, uh, like a glottal, you know, um, sound like, you know, like this dotted H here or any, any consonant between two vowels is missing. 
it will or disappears i should say it 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 triggers this concept called propensatory lengthening right so this is why these forms here have um the long like this calere has this long uh o and this long i in the bogum in, in these chatting languages but i like to challenge that because these are words for sand and not desert itself and although the desert has sand that doesn't mean that these are in fact cognates because how do you explain the glottostop and caler and um it doesn't lead to words for desert in these languages right so so when we go to chiluba for example we have lucele sand of a river lucinge sand chisinge and it should be noted that when ng is followed by e it can become z and then z into vocal it can become r and then in some languages l so i, I consider all these the same so sand of a river sandbar in a river and island and then we have in chikam nesh grain of sand and the share grains of sand right so i'm thinking that more so uh this is the these forms in western chadic are actually the behair forms of these like this in middle egyptian and chiluba which is the bere forms for those who are familiar with that model so I don't, I don't equate these. I think these are, are not the same in the TOB uh, database. Here's some more words for uh, sand in Egyptian that actually mirrors more uh, the forms that we see here in Chiluba and in Western Chadic, right? So, um, so we get the word Sahara probably from the Arabic because uh, the plural so i don't know how you would have deserts i think because you you would think of the desert in terms of a collective so i think it it might see this this is why it it, it could also you know you could make an argument for sand right because of the plural form in in arabic but um but notice that is this this asharu means a yellowish red and alike so this this may so if, if we were just to look at all of the the evidence it would appear as if when we talk about desharet that desharet itself does in fact derive from a root desher meaning red right and uh but we'll we'll see later on that this isn't the case in that it it is in fact an issue of um the rabus principle and uh and and how there's a play on words um but um i'm bringing up this text here this is a comparative semitic linguistics and manual by patrick r bennett that's where i learned to do my comparative linguistics with the semitic languages right um but i this is just a side note so i'll just run through this quickly so this is this is what i was meaning earlier when when you have when you're dealing with these languages and why you have to be careful in in how you associate color terms so for example this this root here in um in the semitic languages the root of it means quote unquote green like green plants or whatnot and they try to equate this with the same word for green in the ancient Egyptian language. But notice that the, you know, there's a wide range of associations and derivations from this term. So like in Akkadian, you have to be green, but also to be pale in color, right? And it's a word for vegetables, but then when you go in Ugaritic, it is Yerik, meaning gold. Well, gold isn't green, but when you see the form in Akkadian where it means pale, you can see now that you, you can see how the word for gold derives from the, that same consonant root, right? And so when you go into Hebrew, there's variances for moss, 
you know, uh, to be green, green plant veg vegetables and like Syriac, we had to be green and pale, just like in Acadian. And, um, and then we go to the Gaez and then lark meaning gold. And you see gold and then a leaf and then a sheet of paper. So you can see all these different variations of this root and the semantic range. So that's what I'm saying. Like even this green here, it can be from the darkest green in range to a pale yellowish um, color. And then from that to gold, right? So just, just keep that in mind when you're, when you're discussing uh, color and languages, right? So now let's get to the order of the day, right? So, um, hold on one second. Had to refresh myself. So now I'm back. All right. So what I've, you know, been arguing for a number of years is that there is that Egyptian words are built from a consonant vowel monosyllabic roots. And when you see a biconsonantal word and a triconsonantal word, that there these words consist of a consonant vowel root with a consonant vowel suffix or series of suffixes and or prefixes to the root, right? Now, so you can see, so I'm, I'm making the argument and I'm approving in a little bit that there is a sh root in Egyptian. And so we can look at these forms here, shu or shawa, shim, meaning dry, dried, drought. Shuayit, wasteland, desert. So you can see from this semantic. So, so the point is here is to look at other words for desert and to see the semantic evolution, how the words for desert came to be. So we can see that the characteristic about the desert here for Shuayit, wasteland, desert, comes from the word Shu meaning dry, dried, and drought. So it is the absence of water that, and the absence of moisture that defines Shuayit desert. So you have Shuwu, dry land. Shuayit, a dry place. Partial reduplication here, Shu Shuayit, dryness, drought. Shuayit, dry spot. So Shuwi, to make dry. Should we dry pieces of wood? Should we you dry grass? Hey, rushes, right? So you 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 see that the common theme for all of these is the absence of water. So let's go to the next. So this same esh root defines these words here. So hopefully you can see them all. And of course, if you have the book, it's in chapter three, towards the end of the chapter, when I'm talking about Desheret, right? So, so shu, emptiness, absence, so shui, to make empty, shu, to be empty, to be lacking, to be devoid of, to be missing from, to be vacant, unloads, shuit, uh, empty sheet of papyrus, tep shu, ruin, neglect, decay, wish, to be empty of. So you can see emptiness has a W before it and a W after it. So wish to be empty of, to be destroyed, wish vacant place, space interruption. And because of this notion of empty, it, it gives a derived form, meaning needy man, a poor man. Shirer, to be poor. Shirer, to become impoverished. Shiru, poverty. Shavrit, impoverishment. And so you see this, this notion of emptiness, lackness, to make empty, to be devoid of something, to be destroyed or ruined, in poverty, they're all in the same semantic range. So now we have the W was now replaced with R, to stop, to block up, sure, sure, disordered, distracted, upset, to be perturbed. And now... 
it gives um, way to a word sure meaning threaten. And then we have this word desher meaning angry. Desheru wrath. Right. So it is from this SR root that you get this word desher meaning angry and then desher ru meaning wrath. And so to prove that the D is in fact a prefix on the uh, SR root, we look at these examples. So we see on the left hand column, we have this word nej meaning flower. Then we have a the same word with the T suffix, nejet, flower. Now we have the same word with the N prefix disappear and they replace it with a W. And they add a Y suffix and a T suffix. So now it's flower for bread. So this is this is these are the exercises that you show to prove that ancient Egyptian, especially Middle Egyptian, is monosyllabic. Because you, each consonant represents a morphine. And so now when you have the D prefix, what I've highlighted in red to that word ju, it now means flower, coarse flower. And so we have another variant of it is, is D prefix. Now the W prefix, just like on this form here, ju meaning flower. So let's look at this word here, hen, bow down, to nod, concur, approve, heed, feel inclined to. So it's H-N. So now we have the D prefix, D-H-N, to bow down, to bow to, to touch the ground with the forehead. Right? So now we have this word hen meaning head. And then we have the henet, forehead. And then, of course, this word sure, meaning threaten, and then desher, angry, and then desheru, wrath. And it's from this word angry to be angry that we get the word red from, right? And this is just some, some added, uh, this is just an added bonus because sometimes the D prefix or the D sound or whatever the, that sound is supposed to represent, it also comes from the J or what we believe to be a J sound, um, which is given by the D with the underline. And just letting you know that this interchanges with the, or it's a dialect variant of the, the S. So we do these exercises to look for dialectical variations of these terms, right? So I can y'all can pause when you come revisit this because this is going to be important later, right? And we can see the j as a prefix here, and so I want I want to to show you this. So this is how we know that the word uh, Sahara. And uh, in the Semitic languages was borrowed from Egyptian because they can't provide the monosyllabic or even the bisyllabic roots for the word Sahara because the root would be Kheb. And they don't have a system of the, the S and D prefixes. So when, when um, excuse me, so when they inherited, they had it with the S this dialect variation, the S prefix, because they, they um, corresponds with the J and Z sounds, right? And so you can see it here. And so I'm doing a comparison between dialect A and dialect B in Egyptian and with the collagen. So the collagen language has, has dropped all the prefixes, you know, related to these terms here. But it has these variant pronunciations like like you see in Egyptian. And so you can come back to this and verify this um, as well. So evidence for the consonant vowel root in Chiluba Bantu. So that that esh root that we saw earlier in in Chiluba, it is osha or usha meaning to burn, to set fire, to be intense, spicy. Ash, la, le, to burn. 
Shile, Shila, to be burned, to be consumed, to be used. Usheka, Ushika, burn, catch fire. Shidisha, the L becomes D when followed by I, burn, burn down. Shila, Shila, an idiophone, burn down. Kulungulu, Shila, Shila, completely burn. And then the, the uh, non palatalized variants, Salala, itch, and burn. And so this is going to be very important, right? Because this esh root manifests itself as sure burn up in Egyptian. Sher, this is the nasalized of Vular Trill, which is a R type of sound. So sheru to burn pain, to be sore. Sherim to be hot, to burn. And then just like how we have in Chiluba, where there's the sh variants, but also the s, s variant, you have the same thing in Egyptian. So in sir, to burn, to be in flame, inflammation, flame, fire. Nezeret, flame. Nezer, angry. So the concept of fire and to be angry come from the same um, root and set. And this is going to be important. So remember when we go back all the way to the beginning, what are our, what are our forms here? Flamingo, desert, desheret, flame. Right? So let's go back to where we were. Right? So as you all know, I always encourage those of you who are studying the ancient Egyptian language and are learning linguistics that you have to do a, a lot of experiments dealing with the internal dialect variants of the forms. Because that same sh that I mentioned is the root remember i said that you know verification comes from chiluba this word osha or usha meaning to burn set fire to be intense spicy right it it is found also in egyptian as a root and so this is taken from the the new variant of the tla and so in in a lot of the words now in a tla when you search It'll have this little sign here. For those of you who are familiar with mathematics, this means to, to, to square the root of a, uh, something or the square root, but it's, it's used in this context just simply to mean a root. So they're saying that there's a, a root that means fire, and, and you find it in this word het, meaning fire, flame, or burn on the body. So this T nominalizes actually um the verb right and when you go to the tla this is how it looks it'll give you uh, a lot of the words that are built from that same root so it says so it gives this what you see right here the fire and then it'll say the root of and then it'll give you the following words here so you see all these different variations remember i said once it, once it's past a monosyllabic root um, any consonant after that is a grammatical morphine. And that's exactly what you see in these variations. So fire, flame, fiery one, a serpent, fiery one, fiery, fiery. Uh, I have to look what it, whatever that word is there. But it's, this is all the same root, right? So, but you should know that the h and the sh interchange. There's a dialect correspondence between these two forms, right? So now let's prove it. So, so as I've stated since, you know, who knows when, that the ancient Egyptians, there's, there's words that are the same word that are, the syllables are reversed. So you see, I've, I've highlighted these in different, two different colors, so it, it helps facilitate your eyes so that you can see, but let's look at this first row. So in Chicom A, and then in Chicom B is the second row, second column, I should say. 
So first row, first column. Rec, beneficial, to be effective, useful. Sheru, to be useful, to do, right? These are the same words, but because these interchange in our different dialects, so when um, it, is, it is followed by the nasalized of blue or true here, it becomes sh. When it's preceded by the nasalized blue or true, it means ch, right? So, rechi, plant, rechu, crops, shir, plants, vine, trees, trees in general, fruit, crops, flowers. Same word. Rachet, provisions, bread, shir, shir, cake, pastry. Rachet, a room, a storeroom. Shred, container for a storage of grain, a storehouse. You see how these um you know our interchange so when i see a form for example like these my first instinct as a sarm hotep who has been doing this since the civil rights movement i wasn't even born during the civil rights movement just my but anyway since the civil rights movement is that i always look for the inverse of these forms and then the inverse based upon the interchange based on the regular sound meaning correspondences that we set up in examples just like this so so now when you see that form sheru to burn pain to be sore we know that it corresponds to this fire flame or fire flame sharum to be hot to burn Right, like these all derive from the same root. They are the same. Right, so this is going to be important. Keep in mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you my process, right? And so this is this is something that detractors can't do. They can't show their work, right? So now. Because remember, when, when my process is to always look for the dialect variant, because ancient Egyptian language, there is really not a single language unto itself. It's several different dialects and or languages that were spoken in ancient Egyptian, related and non-related. And so when you look at this form, when you, when you, when you want to prove the meaning of, for example, Kemet, or even Desheret, you do it by what we call a proof by contradiction. And so you find the internal cognate for it. And so that word Desher has a variant in Egyptian. And so we know this as Herset, right? Which means hill country, foreign land, desert. And it has this, this, this S suffix added to it, as well as another T suffix, the, the, the T of place, right? And so it is, you can find it in this phrase. So notice that this S now is replaced with this sign here, which is some kind of um, fricative, right? And so I, I put on a note here that that symbol here interchanges with Z and S. And so if you have my text, you can go to these sources. See Pust 1999-106 and Camerzel 1998, page 34. Right, for anybody who thinks I'm making this up. And so you got to know, so I'm, I'm giving you a, another bit, bit of information. You have to know what sounds or what graphemes interchange with each other. So you can see that when this sign here is followed by T, this transforms into S. Because this is a Z, a Z time. So it, 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 it distinguishes itself. So these are allophones of each other is what we say, right? And so, this this concept to desert something along the way 
to throw, to abandon, to dispatch, to end, to finish. And this is a, a loan from the um, Semitic languages or what they argue, Kreb. But you can still see it really has a variant of that same root uh, in, in even in the Semitic form of the word for desert. Right. And so it's from this notion of to abandon, to dispatch, to throw, that you get this form hill country, foreign land, desert. Right. And it's not going to seem like it, it is is related, but I'm going to show you how. Right. So. Because this. Remember that this, these are three consonants in sequence. But this underlying a, oh, excuse me, this H with the loop under it with the nasal lines of Bular trill is found in, in these words here. So that that notion to throw, to abandon, because that's what a desert means. You know, so in verb form, when you say so and so deserted me or they left me deserted. That means they abandoned you. They left you empty. You're not there. Right. So so this concept here to empty out, to shake away. And you see here that that form that we saw previously, this career to throw, to abandon, to dispatch, to end, to finish. Right. So remember what we said, the H with the loop under it interchanges with the S with the V over it. So you have this form wesh to be destroyed, to destroy, to be empty of. This notion of emptiness, when, when um, you add this suffix, now it's a derived form that means to throw, to abandon, to dispatch. But this comes from the same root, meaning to be destroyed, to destroy, to be empty of. And so when that when you add the nasalize of Vular trio to tip out the spill to empty. So you can tell that this is a suffix of, of this form. And so now notice this form here, Sheresu, desert northeast of Egypt. So this, this may lend credit to Alessandra Nibi, who cited I uh, forgot what scholar was earlier that talked about Desheret was really speaking to the northeast in Egypt. And so we have a dialect variant of the word Desheret because the D and S interchange. And so in Desheret, it is the D prefix. And in this form, the the d becomes s and becomes suffixed here so desert northeast of egypt Sheresu. right these are all the same word they all come from the same root and with each morpheme that you add a different semantic layer is added to the root because all of these come from a word for fire right so let's go. So we, we see the same thing in Egyptian, excuse me, in Chiluba. So in Chiluba, you have Jisuya, the G. And when you say uh, in Chiluba, even though it's D as in Darrow, for some reason, they pronounce it more like a J. So it's like Jisuya, G-O-S-H, desertification. Jishila, being burnt, desertification. Jishil, parched land. Mushila, carbonized residue, fly ash, pulverized coal used to blacken. Shila, to be calcined, to be consumed, to be worn out. And this, this, it's this concept of fire, which is the, which is this root here. So the notion of fire comes the idea of to burn and then to consume and then to be empty to be destroyed. So that's where these, the original root of that comes from, to be destroyed, to be, uh, to destroy, to be empty of, because of the fire and consumption. And from there comes, you know, in one direction to be empty, to spill out. And in the other direction, it goes in the words for the desert itself, 
right? And we see the same thing here in Chiluga. And so we have in the Yoruba language, this same root, Ashale, barren and worn out land, desert, Asale, desertification, Kosile, Fo or Fao Sile, desert, Ikosile, desertion, and in Igbo, Alzala, Alzara, arid land, desert, wilderness. So you can you can see these forms with the same, or uh, you can see these roots with the same form in in Yoruba, Igbo, in Chiluba, as we find in um, in ancient Egypt. And so it's from this concept of burning and destruction and 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 cons consuming, you know, heat and drought shrinks things. So this is where you get this this idea of um, little and meager and small in ancient Egyptian. So in it, it brings out what I call a diminutive thing. So in uh, Chiluba, we would say shawula, stunted, to degenerate, to diminish, to prevent the growth of or development. So you can see, you know, these these the, these themes that can also be applied to the desert because a, a desert is a place of no growth, underdevelopment, diminishment, degeneracy, right? And so this sh -r -r, partial reduplication in Egyptian means little, meager, younger, junior, short. But in the pyramid text, there's this, this rare form, deshiruret, the little red one. And so I have here at the bottom, where you know you can find it um, in a TLA and it says assign you this peppy, peppy being the pharaoh. This peppy is your little red one. Does this mean that peppy was red in the black land with black people? Probably not. But you can see here this is actually a play on words because there's a word desher that means red, but because of this double R here, they interpret it as this sherer, meaning little, meager. So that's why when they um, when they wrote it here, you know, and, and we call this phenomenon paronymy, that's why it's defined here as the little red one. Right. And so in Chiluba, again, jishala, to remain behind, to be underdeveloped. And so you can see that same root. So remember the sh and ch sounds are, are allophones, they interchange and they correspond dialectically. So is this monosyllabic root to be a child, per, to be young, right? And then we have shittery to stop, to block up, as we, we mentioned earlier. So, that, so when this means to stop, to block up, it means to remain, to underdevelop, to stop the growth of something, right? And so we have all these different semantic uh, correspondences in the range that helps to, to put some meat on the bones of these uh, consonant structures. So um, I put here some overlapping concepts here that we may revisit i don't want to go into it just yet uh so we may come back to that but you know you you you'll see the same things uh here there's some overlapping concepts so you can uh this is in the book as, as well so you can come back if you have the book already so i wanted to show that the concept of red comes from the notion of to to be angry right and so that's a different semantic, you know, range from where the word for uh, the word for desert comes from, even though they may come ultimately from the same root in terms of fire, ultimately. So like we see here in, in Chiluba Bantu, Jikunze, meaning red from the word Kunza, be become red, become serious, get tough, get angry, to be deprived of, to be in misery. Kunze, red, sunza, to blush. So the K and S um, first in the first consonant position, and then the same thing in Wolof, um, you know, there's, they interchange. So they're allophones of each other. And then this kunjija, to get angry, kunjila, 
is a, a variant form. So, but notice that the word, the same word for red is the same word for to be deprived of, also to be in misery. And so it's the same thing that we see. We have to go back some um, to this to this form here. So when we talk about the same word for emptiness and absence and to be missing, and then you see the same consonant sequence for a word for a needy man, a poor man, to be poor, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Like this, this all comes from the same root. And we can see that either these in Chiluba are separate words that merged or they just derive from the same root. So be de to be deprived of is to be empty, to be in misery, to be poor, a wretched. That's what the word a wretch means. Right. And so this helps to to associate the the, the later characteristics of even Set, who was associated with Desheret, right? And so, but we know Desheret comes from the concept of like destruction and fire and things of this nature. And here's some, some partial uh, circumstantial evidence here. So it says, um, this is from the TLA, uh, and it's from the Stile of Camose, uh, the second uh, Stile of Camose. So it says, uh, and here's the transliteration of the glyphs, and here's the, the translation here in English. So it says, after breaking up, therefore destroying their cities, right? So to, to break up Khaberin in past tense, perfect past tense. So after breaking up, um, and then newt, remember that the word newt is, is a word for village or city, so saying plural. So after breaking up, the cities, their cities, so sin is there. So after after I after after I after breaking up their cities, right, destroying their cities, set fire I to their places. So set meaning place, right? And and so when you see that equals sin, so that's their places. I set fire to their places. And they became red. And so they put in parentheses equals barren. Therefore, ruins uh, heals forever. So that's what you see here. So they um, so they became this. This is the word here that I have bolded for hills. So so uh, eret desheret. So red hills forever. So it. it when when you burn something, they don't turn red. They turn black. They become destroyed. So it wouldn't make any sense for me to set fire to their cities and to break up, and then they just start glowing red. Um, no, they became red. So this is after the fact. This this is not you know. If the whole city was on fire, then you can say yeah, I turned it red. But he says I they became red. So after. So that's why it says after breaking up and destroying their cities. So this wasn't during the process. This is after. So we know that the destruction has already been done. So it turned. So their their hills became red. It wouldn't make any sense. But that's why they put here equals barren, meaning no growth destroyed, emptied forever. Because of the because of the destruction they caused in this part of Egypt that Ta Kemet, you know, has caused. Right. So when we when we see this this concept of Desher Ret, we're talking about a a empty place, a barren place, a wasteland. That's what he's trying to say. I made it a desert. I made it a wasteland. Right. And so the semantic evolution of Desher in Shikam, I argue, comes in these different forms. So you have fire, anger, red, fire to consume, to diminish, to become meager and little. And then fire, desert, barren, wasteland. Right. So the ultimate root is fire, that h, and then it's dialectical form. So when we say Desher, it's in a 
it, it's that's one dialect form, probably the most famous one or the most used one versus the other ones. And so um, so from that sh root, which we find in Chiluba as Osha to burn, and then you know the sh becomes s just like as we showed in chiluba earlier the same thing in egyptian so it's reduplicated burn ashes and then sasa in chiluba be hot to be bitter to be burning temperature to have a fever sasakana to be hot to be bitter and we see that same root in the word shini to be enraged and shinet furry right which equates to chiluba in soka, in soqua, or in sungu. And so that that in more so corresponds to this uh, nasalized voice velar. So ung. So in sungu. Anger, fury. And I don't know why I have anger on here. Ooh, excuse me. Twice, I guess to... I don't know if it's in verb form to anger. I don't think so because it has an end prefix, right? So you, you can see how these roots find themselves in, in the language if you know how to, to, to read it correctly. So these are the complete forms of the word for uh, desher in, in the language. So we can see that it comes from an esh root and so when suffix by w it becomes a word for drought sunlight fire because uh, excuse me sunlight and sun because the root is fire shui to dry to be dry 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 shuwu when it's uh, two different so these are two different w's wasteland and desert dry land Shuwu to shine with light because you get light from fire. And then we have this one where share tip out to spill to be empty. We're sure dry, wither, absence, lacking, be bald. It's the same thing as empty. When you when 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 brothers get about 30 and their hair start falling out, their head is empty. And that's and matter of fact, that's why the um the the hair the d3 hair glyph it is of hair falling out the hair and and it is used for words that mean empty right and so we're sure to dry to parch we're sure dry land dry area we're sure it dry land am sure to burn up you see these different prefixes give different contexts and nuance and that's why you have desheret, fire, flame, desheret, desert, foreign country. All right. And, and the association between foreign country is because, you know, they, they separated the desert, the, the desert at large from, from Egypt itself. That, and, and so anybody that is beyond the desert or who lives in the desert or uh, or whatnot, they know that they are foreigners because the the word Kemet is referring to the land along the Nile, which I've discussed a hundred times. That's a riparian land, right? So so here is the the breakdown of the two terms. So as I stated before, Kim comes from a root meaning to rise, to fill. And then from this notion of to rise and to feel, because we're talking about the Nile River, the Nile River that rises and fills the land with water. And, and if you read the book, you will, you will see the, the primary text for this concept in the, um, in the Egyptian language. And so from that, it becomes complete, full, and then when you suffix it with the T, it becomes, you know, Kemet, the nation, the riparian land. So that's where this concept comes from. So to feel, to rise. But the desheret is the exact opposite. So from this concept of fire and to burn, Osha or Usha, to burn, 
hit fire, flame, burn on the body, comes this notion of with share, to be absent, to lack, to dry, to parch, to dry out, to desiccate, to miss, to be bare. Wesheret, dry land, and then desheret, desert. This is the correct breakdown of the term, not black and red land. And it is not to say that they did not take advantage of the words Kim Black and the word Desher Red when it came to these concepts. But in all the words for desert in their language, they all derive from this notion of to be dry, to desiccate, to dry out, to be absent of life, water, moisture, etc. It is it is empty versus full. That is the dichotomy between Kemet and Desheret. Desheret is empty and Kemet is full, full of water, full of grass, full of vegetation, full of life, animals and the like. A Desheret is empty. It has none of that. No life. You may see a dead snake in there, but for the most part, there's no life there. And that is the dichotomy. So on that note, as I mentioned earlier, for those who just joined the conversation, that um, there is a part two to this discussion. So I didn't want to make this one too long. And so I'm going to I'm going to end the video here. And I am going to start another video. So. I'm going to start that one at exactly three o'clock Eastern time. So that's in 10 minutes. So this will give you some time to go use the restroom, get something to drink and all that good stuff. And the link to the next show is in the description. And for those of you who are on YouTube, it is pinned to the very top. So after this show, you could just go directly to that uh, link. And we'll be ready to go in about nine minutes or so. So see you in a second. TV presents Sankofa, the future of Black History, a unique Black History Month online series exploring all dimensions of time as we chronicle the Black past, command the Black present, and empower the Black future. Workshops include The Future is Black, Why is Black History Under Attack? with Shakara, We Create Value, The Ingenuity of Enslaved Africans with Robin Walker, Ancestral Coding, Agriculture, and the Apobo Library Initiative with Aya Eveli. Quantum Field Theory as African Heritage with Asa Imhotep. For full information including dates and the registration, visit gotkushtv.com. We have made history. We are making history. There is history still to be made. Sankofa, the future of Black history. A Black History Love series not to be missed.